Article 2, and that begins our consideration of the zoning and planning uh, articles. These articles are not subject to uh, amendment, but they often inform what our town looks like. So I've asked the town planner, Jason Bashand, to aid us, assist us in a discussion. And as we've done in recent years, I would entertain a motion to consider articles two through nine as a group. Those are the zoning and planning articles. I'll so move. Moved by Ms. Woolsey, seconded by Mr. Bridal. All those in favor of dealing with these articles as a group, raise your voter cards. Thank you. Down cards. Any opposed? Seeing none, we'll consider them as a group. And in that vein, I would also entertain a motion to waive the reading of articles two through nine in their entirety due to their length. Moved by Mr. Bridal is their second. Seconded by uh, Ms. Barnes. All those in favor of waiving the reading of articles two through nine, voter cards up, down cards. Any opposed? And finally, I would uh, entertain a motion to open discussion on articles two through nine, moved by Ms. Woolsey. Do I have a second? Seconded by Mr. Bridal. All those in favor of moving to discuss articles two through nine, thank you. Any opposed? Um, I'll now recognize our town planner, Jason Bashan, who will take us through articles two through nine, and there'll be um, slides to assist us, and we'll break after each article so that if you have a question, uh, or comment on any article, we'll, we'll take them in that fashion. Um, Jason, please start okay. us off on Article 2. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I just did want to briefly mention that the full text of each of the amendments is out in the uh, hallway and also on the town's website if people want to view that at any point in time. Um, starting with Article 2, I'm, I'm going to do a purpose statement and overview of each of these on Article 2. The purpose is to provide for the review of demolition activities that meet specified thresholds prior to issuance of a demolition permit. As an overview, this article includes a new definition of demolition under section 1.6. A new section 1.8 titled demolition review is proposed to encourage the preservation of buildings and places of ar historic, architectural, and community value. A staff level review of demolition permit applications that meet specified thresholds is also included with said reviews typically completed in no more than 30 days. While this article is not intended to prohibit demolition, it will provide an opportunity to hit the pause button so the town staff may work with developers and property owners to consider practical preservation efforts. Okay, anyone wishing to be heard? Anyone have any questions on article two, which deals with regulations relative to demolition of buildings in our town. Seeing none, Article 3, Jason. Okay. Uh, the purpose of Article 3 is to require new construction and substantial improvements to structures in the title 50-foot wetland buffer to be elevated on pylons. As an overview, uh, this article requires that all new construction and substantial improvement projects within the title wetland conservation district comply with the FEMA guidelines previously adopted by the town for zone BE, special flood hazard area, coastal high hazard areas. As noted in the purpose statement, this would result in the need for those structures to be elevated on pilings. It is also noted that the construction work shall have no adverse impact on adjacent properties. Jason, could you give us a sense of where in town the Tidal Wetland Conservation District is. What, what properties or what generally, what part of town are we, is Article 3 going to impact? We're talking about coastal areas primarily. Um, I would invite actually J.D. or Ray in at any point in time that they wanted to jump in since the Conservation Commission did, uh, were proponents of this article initially. Okay. Um, but those areas, and we did identify how many properties would be affected. It wasn't a substantial number as I recall. I don't have the number okay. with me though. Is it if you know, is it just properties that border the marsh or is it properties that are oceanfront as well? It could be both. Could be both, okay. Anyone wishing to be heard on Article 3? Seeing none, Jason, if you could introduce Article 4. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I would like to be heard, please. I'm sorry, I didn't and, see you. And my remarks are going to apply to Article 3 and Article 4. We have a problem in this community, and these two articles are amending the Wetland Conservation District. The wetlands have expanded 
as all of you know. And we've got to stop any building in this town in wetlands. The Board of Selectmen on the 29th of January received an email from a very nice lady who lives on uh, Island Path and what she said is the following. She says, I'm looking for help with grant money offered through the government to raise our home out of the floods. We live at Island Path and have flooded seven times in 2018 and one additional time this year, 2019. We've been told by the state hazard mitigation officer that we would have to get our town of Hampton to petition for us for grant money. In other words, a community letter of intent for the elevation of our home. I will say to you that I have tremendous respect for the Conservation Commission in Hampton, but we are deluding ourselves as to the town wetlands. People should not be building new structures in the wetlands, and it says clearly, you can read it on your article, We're talking about wetlands, wetlands are wet and there should be no expansion allowed, and there should be no raising up on pilings allowed, because all that's going to do is trap people in their homes while they watch their cars float about in the yard on the water. I am opposed to three and four. We need to wake up as a community and stop, stop any encroachment, any building, any enhancements anywhere in our wetlands. Thank you, Ms. Woolsey. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 3? Oh, over here. Mr. I Griffin. would like to point out that if anyone didn't get the drift of that letter, the lady is trying to get her house put onto stilts. And um, she finds it's probably her only answer from what, how the letter reads. Um, and it, this really doesn't have anything to do with her trying to get the town to do anything. But there are FEMA guidelines. and. There are areas where people are looking to protect their homes. So regardless of what that lady said, she's, um, her letters, I'm not addressing what she was writing in her letter, but she is trying to do what this is calling for. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Ms. Wolsey. Just a, a quick rebuttal. We understand what is happening in this community, and we have got to stop allowing building We've got to stop spending money, whether it's grant money or town money, with the problems that are occurring. Seven times that poor lady's property was flooded. You want to pay to live in a community where you're gonna be flooded seven times a year? We have got to stop the building, the amending, the fooling around and stop any encroachment into the wetlands. Thank you, Ms. Woolsey. Seeing no one else on Article 3, Jason, yes. Article 4, please. Okay. The purpose of Article 4 is to make the calculation of minimum lot area and minimum lot area per dwelling unit consistent in all zoning districts as it relates to the Wetland Conservation District. As an overview, this article modifies Section 2.3.7C of the Wetland Conservation District Ordinance and provides cross-referencing within the definition of lot area in section 1.6 and also through a footnote in section 4.1 which is the section on minimum lot area and 4.1.1 the section on minimum lot area per dwelling unit. The special provision section specifically section C, C1 and C2 are amended so that the required minimum lot area and the minimum lot area per dwelling unit only apply to newly created lots and lots incre increasing the number of existing dwelling units. The corresponding calculation is based on 100% of the lot area that is located outside of the Wetland Conservation District. Thank you, Jason. Anyone <coughs> wishing to be heard on Article 4? Seeing none, we'll move on to Article 5. Okay. The purpose of Article 5 is to provide flexibility to property owners that want to elevate their structures to make them more flood resilient. As an overview, this article amends the existing freeboard requirement in section 2.4.9 
to allow property owners to increase the maximum height requirement provided in Article 4, Section 4.4, an additional one or two feet above the required one foot of freeboard. If the elevation of the structure's lowest floor above the base flood elevation results in the exceedance of the maximum height requirement, then the maximum height requirement shall be increased by the elevation amount that exceeds it, up to three feet. For example, if a property owner in the RA zoning district is at the height maximum and elects to elevate their structure three feet above the base flood elevation, the maximum permitted height of the structure would be increased to 38 feet, which is three feet above the maximum that is usually 35 for that district. Anyone wishing to be heard on Article 5? <coughs> Anyone having any questions about Article 5? Increasing the height for those properties that are in that zone. Ms. Wolsey. Ms. Wolsey. Once again, Mr. Moderator, we are pulling the wool over property owners' eyes. If they think it's going to help them by raising their building three feet on stilts or whatever you call it, they're not going to be able to get in and out. They're not going to be able to park their car in their yard. They'll have to go to the town parking lot, which also may be flooded. We can't address the current problems with global warming and increased flooding by articles like this. And once again, I am totally opposed. Thank you, Ms. Wolsey. Anyone else? Mr. Griffin. Yeah. But once again, there are many homes down at the beach in this area that have had uh, been there for a hundred years and they're probably not going anywhere um, and there are some of the people that do have problems down there that were held over the last 40 years in some areas to 35 feet when today they could build there at 50 feet um, and today with this thing with this past it would be even a little bit more but the problems that exist for these people with these homes it's because it was restricted to uh, um, 35 feet at one time and the play people weren't allowed to build their houses big enough to be out of the uh, areas that are affected today. So a lot has changed over the years and um, everybody that is doing anything to their existing homes are looking to make them better and, uh, and it really shows down there and sometimes they're being rehabbed completely but these little bit of uh, elevation in some cases, the land has even sunk down there. If you lived there for the last 40 years, you could tell the land is actually lower, just like what happens to the town roads. They lower into the ground and have to be made bigger. And that's happened to a lot of people that live down at the beach. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Anyone else wishing to be heard on Article 5? <coughs> yes, Ms. Hossard. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, good morning. Keith Hossard, 173 Mill Road. I'm hearing a lot of conversation about we're building on wetlands and we're encouraging building in wetlands and all these homes are built on uplands that flood. They're not wetlands. The reason we propose to increase the height is because we do recognize that the ocean levels have changed over the last thousands of years, and we're recognizing it maybe a little bit more rapidly now. But these homes are built. We're allowing them to have more flow through underneath their property, so the impact to their own personal property is allowed. This is, it's legal to build where they build. This is allowing them to have more water if there is flooding to go underneath the house and out causing less damage. It's actually encouraging them to build up. Not to build like South Carolina, Georgia, and the Louisiana Bayou where you know you're up 14 feet. Just enough so the water flows in and out. Um, it's also very important that this is implemented as part of our floodplain um, insurance um, compliance. The more regulations we have that allow people to protect their property from Mother Nature or God or whoever we want to call the cause, um, will reduce their rates. The, the flood insurance is um, recognized and will reduce it for everybody that has flood insurance if we have these regulations on our records. Again, 
Um, the planning board is not allowing people to build in wetlands. Conservation does not allow people to be built in wetlands. Our rules and regulations do not allow people to be built in wetlands. I guess the only exception would be if a pier has to be rebuilt or a bridge. But they have to go through wet, wet water permitting processes. It's a very stringent process. As, as Mrs. Wolseley pointed out in that letter, the woman that would like to improve her own property because of her love of living at the ocean, her love of looking at the marsh, um, is to protect her investments. I love the beach. I'd love to live down there. Um, I think everybody loves to live down there. A lot of people aspire to be at the coast. Um, and people will continue. So what's put regulations in that make it safer and make their insurance costs a little bit less? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lissard. Mr. Griffin. I just wanted to say one more time, all of Keith said it right at the very end. All of these articles are, uh, or many of them, are going to be beneficial in lowering the price of flood insurance for everybody, not just people at the beach, but people that live on the other side of 95 that have flood insurance. And there's a lot of people today from all the different flood insurance things that I go to that uh, even if you live near a, a manhole, you should have flood insurance. So these type of regulations are going to lower flood insurance prices for everybody eventually. All right, Ms. Wolsey. Yes, I, I hate to belabor the point, but I think I'll do it anyway. Does anyone have an idea, Mr. Bashan, perhaps, what it costs a homeowner to have their house in the wetlands raised up and have the pilings, et cetera, put underneath it. What, what would it cost an individual roughly to do that work? We're talking about spending, I imagine, a significant amount of money. I don't know the exact dollar figure, to be honest with you, about that. I don't know if anybody else. So he doesn't have a figure. I don't have a figure. I, I, we, could, we could look at that, but. I, I can that appreciate figure. that, but if we are suckering people in, making them think that they can keep the good old homestead even when the floodwaters come in. I think it's, it's deceiving the public, and I think it's a very, very bad, uh, bad idea. Yes, ma'am. Morning, everyone. I'm Alina Degon. I live on 1 Badcock Avenue in your tidal wave of wetlands, and I'm also running for the planning board open position. So. I just wanted to introduce myself. Um, to answer your question, I have uh, a lot of our neighbors have gone through this process, and it's anywhere from twenty to $40,000, depending on the size of the home, how much they want to go up. It is an ex um, a kind of a good high cost, but you think about once you're up in a certain elevation, my house is a seven feet above the um, wetlands, so my insurance is down. I was paying $2,500 a year for flood insurance, now I'm paying 600. So the price over the time does um, outweigh it when you don't have to pay that flood insurance. So just wanted to answer your question, ma'am. And, uh, but thank you guys for everyone for being here. And, so. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else wishing to be heard on article five? Seeing none, Jason, <clears throat> article six, please. Article six, uh, the purpose of article six is to remove an existing and effective requirement from the conditional uses section of the aquifer protection district ordinance. As an overview, this article would remove a 2016 revision to the conditional uses section that added language requiring a written statement to be prepared by a qualified professional engineer verifying that the property remains in compliance with the conditional use permit and all applicable requirements of the aquifer protection district ordinance. The written statement is to be filed every two years or upon or before any transfer of title. Applicants are already required to submit written findings of fact, verifying that all seven protective measures listed in the ordinance prior to the planning board granting a conditional use permit in this district. Since the requirement only applies to new projects that trip a conditional use permit, the scope is very limited and it cannot be applied equitably throughout the aquifer protection district. Any comment, questions on Article 6? Seeing none, on to Article 7. <clears throat> article 7, the purpose of Article 7 is to specify the zoning districts 
where the recording of a declaration of covenants, conditions, and restrictions is required as part of an accessory dwelling unit approval, or ADU approval. As an overview, this article amends the ADU ordinance to specify that only those ADUs located in the RA or RAA zoning districts will require a recorded declaration. Note that other zoning districts that allow ADUs also allow two-family dwellings by right. ADU declarations state that the property must revert to single-family use with only one dwelling unit if the current or future owner no longer occupies either the principal dwelling unit or the accessory dwelling unit as his or her principal place of residence. Since the intent of the declaration is to protect single-family neighborhoods, it is unnecessary to require the extra legal measure of recording a declaration in zoning districts where someone could simply establish a two-family dwell two dwelling by right. Thank you. Anyone wishing to be heard on Article 7? I gather this is sort of a housekeeping article as we get correct. more familiar with the ADU ordinance, which was, uh, which was introduced, approved uh, several years ago. Yep. Seeing no comment on Article 7, Article 8, please. Okay, Article 8. The purpose is to provide requirements for feather, sail, or teardrop signs and to specify that air dancers are not permitted. And just to clarify what those are, feather, sail, teardrop signs are basically freestanding, not attached to a building, but are attached to a pole, and the flag-like part of them looks kind of like a feather, sail, or teardrop. And an air dancer is a movie, moving, wavy, fan-driven, or inflatable device that's often tubular and depicts a character, just so people know what, what we're referring to here. As an overview, this article amends the, the sign regulations to cover those two types that are not uh, specifically addressed at this time. New definitions of feather, sail, or teardrop sign and air dancer are provided in section 5.2. Air dancers are added to section 5.4.1, which identifies those signs as expressly prohibited in all zones. Specific requirements are established for feather sail teardrop signs under new section 5.4.2J, such as location, quantity, how they're measured, and so forth. Uh, feather sail teardrop signs are added to table one, stating that they may be permitted in the B, BS, BS1, I, and G zones. Air dancers are again noted in Table 1 as prohibited in all zones. Further, Table 2 is amended to state that 32 square feet is the maximum size for the feather sail or teardrop type signs. Anyone wishing to be heard? Any questions on Article 8 relative to sign regulation? Seeing none, on to Article 9. Okay, the purpose of Article 9 is to expand the existing requirement of how stacked parking is addressed in relation to the number of required parking spaces. As an overview, this article amends the existing stacked parking regulation. Currently, section 6.3.10 states that stacked parking shall constitute one required parking space regardless of the number of parking spaces in the stack, but it only applies to condominium conversions of pre-existing non-conforming uses. The proposed article adds a new section 6.3.11, which applies that language to any lot containing one or more residential dwelling units. But it should be noted that properties predating this amendment will be unaffected unless there's a major, major change in the site, such as an application for a condominium conversion or an addition of an accessory dwelling unit as examples. Anyone have any comment, question on article nine, which determines how we count parking spaces and stack. stack. If you have yeah. one behind the other, we'll only count as one space. Even That's if correct. there are three in a row, it'll be one, one space uh, for, for complying with parking requirements. Anyone, any commentary on Article 9? Seeing none, we are...